but it's a very big privilege for me to be here today. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I hope what I'm going to share with you, you find of some value. Um, I do want to thank the traditional um, owners of this land, but on all of the other lands that I've been working on, um, and there's a lot. Um, there's not many places in Australia we haven't been to. Um, so I feel very, very uh, fortunate, lucky, blessed to have been involved in those communities as well. Um, so the project that Alicia alluded to is um, a large national study and it's, I'm, I'm probably going to tell a story more than work through the presentation itself because I think the story is a very powerful story. So when we started the project and I was a, um, the sole researcher on this project because the places we went to most people don't want to go to. We sleep on floors. Um, we have to bring our own food in, all of those sorts of things. So it is a challenge, but I absolutely love the challenge. Um, and it's not, it's not for everybody. Um, so for those who do it, um, we, you feel very lucky to go to some of the places that most people would never go to. So the project started off with, um, when we look at the press, most of the press is very negative. Aboriginal kids can't do mathematics. The teachers who go to those places are terrible teachers. The communities are very dysfunctional. It's all a negative um, deficit discourse. Um, and you know, with every one of those stories, there's probably some element of truth in it. I'm not going to say that that's not, not the case. However, for me, there are lots and lots of teachers who are doing, and schools and principals and communities and Aboriginal education workers, and I'll just use that term as the generic term, who are doing outstanding work. Um, so what I wanted to do with this project was document what is actually working. What are those people doing in those sites that is actually bringing about success for remote Indigenous learners? Because if we can know that, if we're looking at a, spe a spectrum of learners, remote Indigenous kids are the most at risk of um, not succeeding, I won't say failing, but not succeeding in Western mathematics. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. It's very, very complex. It's not a matter of let's go in and implement program X, Y, Z and we'll fix it. It's not, it's not that at all. It, that, that won't work. So what were these teachers doing? So for me, foundational to the research was to say, I'm, I'm an academic um, and I've spent a lot of time in remote <coughs> communities. And in actual fact, I took um, nearly 18 months off at one stage and went into a remote community in Central Australia and worked as the CEO and principal of an Aboriginal owned and operated um, college, a boarding college. And for me, that was, for me, I needed to do that to learn and to understand what actually happens in those places and what are the issues and what do teachers and leaders and the Aboriginal people themselves and the students face in their day-to-day -day, um, engagement or not with school. So for me that was a huge learning curve and it also means now when I go into communities I can talk with teachers because I understand without saying anything what they're confronting. So the project really was, it started off, I wanted to know what teachers were doing that was actually working and I wanted to document that so that we could share it with other teachers. So if a teacher came into Community X and was looking at the maths program um, and didn't know what to do, here were some great ideas for them to use. Um, pick them up and run with them. So for me, when we started it, what I was thinking I would be doing is going into lots of classrooms and observing teachers and picking up tips from those teachers about what they were doing. The outcome was very different. Um, and that's what I want to share with you because I think it's, again, it shows the complexity of when you work in remote Indigenous schools. Now, even though I'm talking about remote Indigenous schools, the thing that is really um, salient and poignant is that if it works in these contexts, it's probably going to work in your low SES communities. It's going to work in um, your communities where you've got a lot of um, English as second language learners because every community we went into, Standard Australian English was almost a foreign language because in community they either spoke a traditional language or they spoke a Creole. So coming to school and learning maths in English was like when I went to school and I was trying to learn French. You know, The only time I spoke French was when I was at school, so it was very hard to learn it. So I sort of use that analogy for these kids when they're coming in and we're talking about two halves make a whole and in their heads they're thinking you put two halves together and you make this thing here, um, a hole. And, it, and if you're using that donut metaphor, 
or, or the donut as an example, it kind of makes sense. So how do they actually unpack all of the words that we use to make sense of the mathematics? So I think the lesson, lesson from today's talk is that the things that we've learned from this project, I think, apply everywhere. And they probably would also apply at PLC and Knox Grammar and your very elite schools. Because what it's about is what is good practice in mathematics and what's actually working. Okay? So here we go. Um, I don't want to sort of spend a lot of time on this because my hunch is most of you want to know, well, what did you actually learn from the teachers? So I'll skim through some of this. So when we talk about the margins, um, I don't want to use those deficit words about disadvantaged kids, um, kids who are excluded, all of those things, which is really what we do a lot in maths, is we actually, through our own practices, we exclude many of our kids just by the, the what we teach, the way we teach it and so on because it's culturally, linguistically, socially not the way that they would normally work and we do it in very subtle ways um, which is what I think what Alicia was alluding to when I pushed boundaries a little bit. So the Remote Renumeracy Project and um, I'll give you a website later on. All of the case studies of the 39 schools are up on a website and you can freely access them because that was the other thing. I didn't want to go to a commercial publisher and say publish this um, because I want, to, I want teachers to have access to it. So all of the case studies have been written up in a language for teachers so that they can get the ideas of the practices that those teachers were using and you can implement them in your own classroom. So we went to, we developed 39 case studies. There were four schools that we went to that we didn't write a case study up for various reasons. And the schools are scattered all over Australia. Um, we interviewed probably close to 300 people in the end. And they were um, mainly teachers. We in always interviewed the leadership team at a school. And we inter interviewed where there was an Aboriginal person working at the school, where they were willing. We'd interview those as well. And often there were other people in the school that we'd interview, depending on the structure of the school, because the schools were all very different. We observed over 100 lessons, probably a lot more than that. And of course, when you go into schools, you collect all of their school policies, what they're doing in maths, some of the um, worksheets, not worksheets, the um, activity sheets that the teachers were using, those sorts of things. So there's an absolute plethora of that sort of um, paper document as well, paper documents as well. Um, so this is what we did. We always went into the school. We always talked to the leadership team first. I didn't go in with a preset idea and I did not go in and do research about the school before I went to the school. I wanted to hear it from the horse's mouth. What were you doing? So the leadership team generally gave us the big picture of the school. We then interviewed teachers and the people at the chalk face and we observed lessons. And what we were looking for really to develop the case study is what did the leadership team say? So in some places it was um, a teacher principal who was that one person, a one teacher school, two teachers, two teacher school with a teaching principal, through to multi-campus schools um, from early childhood right through to vet. So we've done the whole gamut. Um, and what we really looked for was if the leadership team said this, we hope the teachers said this and there was some alignment. And then we, what we saw in the classroom matched with this is what they did, this is what they said, and this is what the the vision of the school was. Now there's always a little bit of slipperiness in that, but what we did when we wrote the case studies, we wrote the case study about where there was the synergy between what the leadership team said, what the teachers said, and what the teachers did. Because that, that, that's in a sense what the, the research should be showing. Um, we observed a lot of lessons, lots of notes, we coded it all, um, we did productive pedagogies to look at what they were doing because it was a, a way of um, measuring, for want of a better term, or profiling is, is a better term, of what those teachers were doing. So what we've done is we've done a case study for every school individually. Um, according to ethics, we're never allowed to name schools, as most of you will know if you've participated in research. But after we did the first case study, the principal actually wanted her school name because she was very proud of what they were doing. But also, it was recognition of the school itself. So then we had to go back to all our departments to see if they were happy for the schools to be named. And we had to go back to our university ethics, which was the biggest challenge, to see if they could be named. And in the end, all the schools have been named. So if you go onto that website, you'll actually see the schools name, name, as the named case study. Mm -hmm. But in any subsequent report we write, we're not allowed to name the school um, for the obvious for obvious reasons. Um, 
And then we've done a meta-analysis of the overall project. So this is kind of the distribution of the schools we did. Um, we've done Catholic, government and independent schools. We've been to Western Australia, Queensland, South Australia, New South Wales and the Northern Territory. Sadly, the Northern Territory government uh, Department of Education was the only Department of Education that did not give us permission to go into their schools. So that's why there's no government schools. Um, so it's not a reflection of the Northern Territory itself. But if you look at what's happening in the Northern Territory, they're very, very circumspect about researchers coming in and writing negative reports. This is a strength-based project. There is nothing that I've written that is negative. We did ask the teachers to talk to us about what was happening in those schools, so we did get a sense. We couldn't say um, if they were doing an attendance strategy. I did not want to say the attendance strategy was working because they had 80% attendance. When anybody who knows that school, particularly when it's named, would know that that's not the case. So we did want to know the warts and all story, um, but none of the warts are actually published. It's only what they're actually doing. Um, and that's been deliberate. Because that's my, can I just say, um, are most of you teachers? Anyone not a teacher? Okay, all right. Because as you would know, the last thing you want is somebody coming and, and giving the negative story. And there's too much of that go, teach, teacher bashing stuff that's going on. So this report, this study is not a teacher bashing, it's a celebration. And one of the nice things that came out of it, because we asked the teachers to tell us about their success, when you're in these contexts, and probably any, any classroom nowadays, um, is it's a, it's, a, it's a hard slog and often you lose sight of the successes you have. So getting the teachers to talk about their success, afterwards they realised they were doing some great work rather than getting stuck at the, at the chalk place thinking this isn't working, this isn't working. But in actual fact when you look at the big picture there was a lot of stuff that was working. So that was a really positive spin off from the teachers. So this gives you a little bit of an idea of where we went and as uh, Leisha said, we've been to some really remote places. Some of those places took us two or three days to get to. Um, so you can sort of see we have covered a lot of places. We didn't do Victoria for obvious reasons. There, no, there are no remote, very remote schools in Victoria or Tasmania. Um, so by definition, our inclusion of our schools were this. We included schools on NAPLAN, even though NAPLAN is problematic, but it is the only objective measure we've got of success and if you go on to NAPLAN you'll find that the schools that we went into when you look at their NAPLAN um, scores they've got a lot of red most of them aren't reaching national um, benchmark standards but what we looked for was when you compared them to comparable schools or like schools so what we were looking for were schools that I had gone from red to pink to white to light green to dark green so they were, they were doing something that was working, so there was some success in there. Or we looked at schools that had green in their comparison with like schools, but that had to be green for a number of years. So it just couldn't be a once-off, because in some of these remote schools, all it takes is for a teacher to come in, bring their kids in, and that will skew the results, and the results will go up. So it's not a reflection of good pedagogy, it's a reflection of who was at the school at that point in time. So what we were looking for was some consistency over those years as well. We also went by recommendation, and you might say, well, why would you do that? Um, some of the district directors, some of the teachers would say, make sure you go to school X. They are having a lot of success, and even though their, their scores may not have reflected that, they were having success. So one story is, we went to a remote boarding school, and the boarding school was set up because they wanted the community wanted the kids taken out of community because there was a lot of distractions in community and the kids weren't engaging in, in education. So they took them out of community and put them into this boarding school for kids from that community. Um, so these are secondary school kids. They might have been working at a grade one or two level in numeracy. When they had those kids at that school for a whole year, they added three years on to their numeracy scores in one year. So even though those students may have been, after one year, might have only been working at year four, which is still very low, the school had added a lot to those kids. So that's what we were looking for was those stories as well. So success doesn't mean that you're reaching that green benchmark on that plan. We were seeing success in very, very broad terms. The other thing was the schools all had to be remote or very remote according to um, 
my schools, and they had to have 80% Indigenous because there are a lot of remote schools, like the school at Yalara. Um, it's very remote, at, that's at Uluru. Um, very remote, but most of the kids, nearly all of the kids in that school are for the children from the families who work at the resort. So there were no Indigenous kids. So we were really looking for how are teachers working with Indigenous kids. Um, and as you can see from before, we had a, a variety of schools across Australia, geographically, from the different systems, from different age groups, um, and what they were actually doing. Just quickly, if you want to go to the website, this is what it looks like. To find the website, just go to the University of Canberra, which is where I'm aligned to now. I can't say employed anymore because I'm just recently retired. Um, go to the University of Canberra and use the search tool and just type in remote numeracy. All the case studies will come up um, and you can access those um, and all of the reports as well. Um, so this is actually the project website when you get onto it. It will just take you straight there. So what did we find? One of the things that, that really struck me with this project was that um, I thought that we would be going into schools and we would be looking at what the teachers do, as I said at the start. However, sometimes we'd ring a school up and say, look, we need to, we'd like to involve the school in the project for these reasons. And I said, but we're not doing anything in numeracy. We haven't even looked at our numeracy program yet. So for example, um, a school in Western New South Wales, they had decided that they needed to focus on student welfare, student wellbeing. And in that process, they were making strong links with community. They put in um, Aboriginal um, liaison officers. So if kids didn't come to school, some an Aboriginal person would go to their homes and check out what was going on in the home. Sometimes the kids may not have had shoes. They may not have had any food to send the kids to for lunch. And even though there was a lunch program, some families are very proud and they didn't want their kids to go to the lunch program because then people would know they didn't have food. And so the liaison person would then fix that problem go and get the kids some shoes, go and get them a uniform, make sure they had lunch in a very subtle way so other people didn't know. Their attendance was going through the roof. So logic says if the kids are coming to school, they're happy, they're fed, they're feeling safe, they're going to learn and they're going to learn maths. So what I, what I, I started to realise is we just can't look at classroom practice. Classroom practice doesn't exist in a vacuum. So what we found, there are actually three levels of practice that we need to consider. So this is after the 39 case studies, and I can say not one of those case studies is exactly the same as another one. What one school did could be very different from another school. So each level interacts with the others. I'll take you through that in a minute. Um, each of the school, each of them dressed, had, had to address having a strong learning culture at that school. It wasn't a punitive culture. Um, remembering at the time when we were doing some of this work, it was when Abbott had brought in the attendance offices um, and kids were forced to come to school. I was at a school at one stage, I was sitting out waiting to do some interviews and all of the people, all the um, uh, attendance officers, I didn't know who they were at that point, came out and they sat outside the principal's office. And I'm thinking, what the heck is going on here? A minute later, about <coughs> half a dozen police rocked up. I'm thinking, oh my God, what's going on here? And I heard them somebody say, we're going to go and round the kids up. There's too many of them down the river. Just the word round up, it sounded like they were cattle. Um, and that was the language that was being used. But the schools had to start building attendance under that Abbott attendance strategy. What happened then, they went down to the river, they rounded up all these kids, brought them back to school. Um, if you're down at the river having a lot of fun, the last place you want to be is at school. So those kids came back to school and they created mayhem. So you've got to ask about the whole attendance strategy. So the schools had developed a strong learning culture, which is most of the schools we were at, I should say all of the schools, in one way or another, um, were having success. So that learning culture was um, very important. Um, and what we also found was there was a lot of one-off programs. So some schools had bought, one school had bought into um, a maths program that cost them $80,000 a year. It was a two-teacher school and a principal. To me, I'm thinking 80000 You could have had a couple more teacher's aides at the school. You could have had another full-time teacher. And that was just a maths program. The maths program was an online program. And one of the things you'll see if you read the reports, we try not to name any program for obvious reasons. Um, these schools are remote. They have satellite dishes to get the internet. 
If it's cloudy, guess what? They don't have internet. So what was the point of having an online program? $80,000. So um, they wiped that program. So the one-off programs don't work. So I think that's, that's another message I'd like you to take away. Please don't think that if you buy program X, that's going to, inverted commas, fix your maths um, pro program at your school. So the whole project is a strength-based project. So it really is about what are these teachers doing that's actually working. So we looked at the strengths rather than the deficits. So here's, here's the model. Um, where I thought we would be would be in this enacted stuff. This is the stuff. The enacted level is what are the teachers doing at the level of the classroom? But what we found was a bit like the story about the well-being. We found schools um, had to have a vision. They had to have good leadership. They had to have a way forward that was going to say, this is where we're going. This is what we're doing. Most of the schools had a whole school approach to their mathematics. So it wasn't a case of you do this, you do this, you do this. Because in these communities, there's a lot of um, teacher rotation. So sometimes teachers only stay for two years. At one point in the territory when I was teaching up there, the average stay of a teacher was three months. The average stay of a principal was 12 months. So you can imagine what it is for sustainability of programs in those schools. And you go into the libraries and there's so many different maths programs that they've bought. Somebody says, I'll try this, try this, try this. So what we've found is that we need to think about three levels of practice when we're thinking about a good maths program. We have to think about the vision. What's the vision for this school? And I think the fact that, and I don't, I'm not going to say this is the vision you should have because the culture in your school, the people you serve, the people you work with are all different. <laughs> And so you really have to take the needs of your community, the interests of your community, the culture of that community. Again, whether that's at PLC or whether that's at Dumaji or another or Palm Island, um, even though I work at Canberra, I live in Queensland. Um, you've got to take that, the, the needs of that community. A remote desert community is very different from a coastal community, which is very different from a community in Redfern. So you need to have that vision about what is it that our school, our children, our family needs? So having that coherence, having a vision. But I think the thing that was consistent across all of our schools is that everybody had high expectations. This is the Chris Sara work. It wasn't coming from Chris, but they had high expectations of the kids. These kids can learn mathematics. That is so important. Um, and they had high expectations of the teachers. Some schools would say, if you don't buy into our program, you might as well leave now. It's not worth you staying. There's enough stress in a remote community apart from somebody coming in and trying to stymie a program. So having that strong vision was really important. Having distributed leadership was also really important. None of the principals or none of the leadership teams that we worked with were of that authoritarian kind of dictatorial principalship where this is what you will do, this is this and this is that. It was much more of a distributed leadership model. Which comes to the middle level, which is the enabling practices. And in the enabling practices, two of the most important things we saw were those schools that had, like, I think in Victoria you have them as a numeracy coach. But somebody in that school, so if you think about these remote communities, most of the teachers that are in them are first year out. Most of them are city kids. Most of them have never even seen or talked to an Aboriginal person. And yet here they are in, an, in a remote community dealing with all the issues of isolation. Many of the communities get flooded in in the wet season, so they, they're stuck there. Um, all the issues around culture, all of those sorts of things. So what they had was a, a numeracy coach. And that numeracy coach, you can't get teachers out. We're bringing teachers down to a PD in Brisbane from one of the communities um, next year. It takes them two days by the time you're linking your flights to get to wherever you're going. There's no flights on a weekend. So we have to keep them over in Brisbane for the weekend to fly them back Monday. So for a two-day workshop, they're out of community for a whole week. They don't have the luxury of um, emergency supply teachers because there's no one in community who can do that. So the other teachers have to take up their load while they're out. So the numeracy coaches in these schools were really important because they actually mediated between the vision of the school and what the classroom teachers needed. So in one school, attendance is at, in remote communities 
generally isn't that good and they're only for 80%. But in many schools it might only be 50 or 40%. So even though they might have 12 kids in their classroom, on any given day there might only be six. So one school decided after they had savage cuts from their department that they would load up their classes knowing full well it was very unlikely that they'd get all the kids at any one time. And they took one teacher offline and that teacher then became the numeracy coach because they felt they needed support with mathematics, which is not um, surprising for anyone who's in teacher education because we know most primary school teachers don't like mathematics. It's their least favourite subject. So when they go into a remote community and they've got all of those other issues, they need support. So that, numer that enabling person um, was really important. And the other one was the role of the Aboriginal people in the community themselves. Having them come in, and we've seen a lot of team teaching where the teacher says it in English, the Indigenous person will say it in the home language. Um, because if you think, in, well, where I was in Central Australia, for example, I think in English we've got 65 or 67 prepositions. In Pitanjara there are six. So how do you describe location? near, next to, beside, all of those words that we use in English are absent in um, Pitanjara. That doesn't mean to say they don't know that somebody's near, next to, but they don't have the language. Similarly, they don't have comparatives. So if something you say to an Anangu person, how far is it? And they say, it's a long way. It's a long way. It's a long way. So they will use a lot of intonation and gesture. So those words that we use in mathematics, which are really common, are not in their home language. So it's a lot about teaching. So the Aboriginal education worker, the AEW, serves a critical role in mediating the school language and the home language. So they were really important. And then there's the enacted practices, which is what I want to focus on in the rest of the talk. So for me, I could have just sat down and thought, well, here's the list of all the things the teachers do. But I don't think that works. How did we make sense of one school um, that might have had, um, now we didn't see, I have to say we didn't see any schools using direct instruction, but let's use direct instruction as the example. So you go from something that's a very direct uh, teacher-centred teacher model right through to investigations, child-centred learning. How do you actually make sense of those kind of practices? It didn't make sense to me just to list down all the things they did. So what we've come up with in the project is this notion of norms. There are norms that teachers have in their classroom. And so when we're talking about the enacted mathematical norms, so these are the things that teachers do. So these are kind of the principles that are behind the practices that the teachers adopted. And I think this is where this work now becomes very important for anyone who's thinking about their maths programs. So we have enacted mathematical norms. So all students can learn mathematics to very high levels. Because what we often find, if we're in any disadvantaged or any um, classroom or school that's in the margins, we often focus on deficits. These kids can't do, these kids can't do, these kids can't do. What we do is we change that to say these cat kids can do it. It's my job as the teacher to find ways to enable that to happen. Um, and that's what these teachers were doing. So having that idea that all kids can learn mathematics. So some of the blocks are around language and culture. Like how do you, if you're working with um, Anunu kids, their counselling system is one, two, three, big mob. That's it. Because in the desert, you don't often see too many things that are more. You don't see herds of kangaroos or flocks, of whatever they are, of groups of kangaroos hopping around. You might see one or two, and really they only want one. Because once you've killed one, you've got you've got your tucker for the, the night. So they don't they don't they didn't need a large counting system. Conversely, if you go to the coastal areas, many of those will have much more complex counting systems. But it's still not as complex as our counting system. So how do you teach number? How do you teach place value? How do you teach fractions when your children in their in their home language in their out of school context go one two three big mob? We're in a community and. Um, my research assistant, he said to the director, how many people live in your community? Because sometimes we just need to get a sense. She said, oh, it's a big mob. That was it. So we still didn't know if there were 100, 200, 300, but for her it was, there was a big mob there. That was it. And that's enough. So teaching number can be very, very difficult when you understand where the children are coming from. Um, embedding mathematics is really critical for understanding. 
Um, and I think we know that across the board for all learners. If, if they can see a purpose and make sense of why they need to know that, that mathematics, then they can learn it. But if everything's in the abstract, it's really hard. Um, a bit like learning French. If you're not practicing it, you can't, you can't learn it. Or it's more difficult to learn. Mathematics is as much about the language as it is about the concepts. Now, it makes sense if you're working in a remote Indigenous community, but I would also argue if any of you are teaching in low SES areas, these issues about language are equally important. For example, Working class parents, when they interact with their, and this is some of the other work I've done, working class parents, when they interact with their children, are more likely, and this is a more likely, okay, it's not a definitive statement, working class parents are more likely to say, would you like more ice cream or not? Working class parents very, very, very rarely use the term less in their home language. So if you're working in some of the western suburbs of Melbourne, or if you're working with children whose first language isn't English and you're using terms like three is two, two more or two less than five um, and you're using those terms more and less all the time, what you're really doing is probably your children are missing out on 50% of your maths lesson because they can't get that idea of what does less mean unless you teach it explicitly. Because otherwise you might as well be using any, any other word in there. We know what it means but they don't. So that whole context of language becomes really important um, and being aware of the language of mathematics but also how we teach mathematics itself. So just simple things like asking a question because Aboriginal people would say to me, how do you know this stuff? They want access to our secret business. So when we go to somebody and we'll say, are you going, are you going to Alice on the weekend? We're not really asking if you're going to Alice. We're asking, are you going to Alice and could I possibly get a lift off you? But we don't say, and can I possibly get a lift off you? That's left unsaid. And Aboriginal people often struggle with the unsaid part of our language. Um, and we do a lot of that in mathematics. So, um, you know, there's those classic examples, find X. And you see the kid who's, you know, that kind of standard joke. But what do we mean when we use that term find? We're not actually asking to go looking for it. We're saying calculate the value of. But we don't say calculate the value of. Um, so there's all of those little things that confuse our kids because we don't make the language explicit for kids who don't speak middle-class standard Australian English. Whether that's an Aboriginal kid, a refugee, or a kid in a remote Aboriginal community. Um, transparency in teaching and learning enables the kids to get to the secret knowledge of mathematics. So often when we're teaching things, and a lot of schools now do this, they make the learning intent explicit. Nearly all of the teachers in this program, in this project, made the, the uh, learning intent of the lesson explicit to the kids. Today we are going to learn about addition of fractions. So the kids know we're not putting um, half a block of chocolate with half a block. We're not learning about chocolate, we're not learning about this, we're learning about addition of halves. So that they know then this is what we this is what this is the purpose of the lesson. So they're not going to go off on tangents, they know what they're going to do. So making that that trans making the intent of the lesson transparent is really important. And I think it's important for all kids, but particularly for kids in these remote contexts. Um, and that mathematics has to engage them at all levels of understanding. Teaching a whole class is almost impossible particularly with the diversity in a remote community um, where kids rotate a lot through communities, they're absent a lot, um, and then you've got kids who are there 100% of the time. Um, we went to one school um, and one of our colleagues who's very well known in Western Australia, she just said there's kids at that community that have had 100% attendance for all the years they've been at school and they're still not at benchmark. Her argument was the teachers are failing them because they were failing to target what those kids needed. They were focusing too much on whole class teaching and not targeting. So the idea is you need to target what, what your kids know and then work that out and then make sure that you scaffold them so that they can move forward. Now I don't, I'm not saying you've got to find out where 30 kids are and you've got to develop your 30 kids or 25 kids and you've got to have 25 different lessons. You can group and you can group by all sorts of ways. One of these schools grouped by attendance and performance. So kids who came regularly were in one class. Kids who came fairly regularly but not 100% of the time, they were in another class 
because they were the kids that you could add a lot of capital to with a little bit of extra work. And then they put the kids who were very irregular tenders and often had very poor behaviour in another classroom, almost like a, not a special needs classroom, but those kids did have different needs because they weren't schooled in school practices. Um, and when they were thrown into the, a whole classroom, they disrupted everybody else. So those kids who were attending regularly weren't actually getting what they needed. So that was some of the enacted mathematical norms. So these are the things that happen at the level of the classroom. Um, so these are the enabling. So this is the next level up. So the enabled mathematical norms. Um, teacher quality is essential for, for quality learning. Having quality teachers in your, class, in your school is really important. So um, recruitment, professional learning, um, and retention of those teachers is critical in, in, well, in any context, but particularly in these contexts. Teacher support is really important. Supporting your teachers socially, professionally, mentally, all of those things was critical. Um, have, and as I said, the key, the key person, like whether you call it a numeracy coach, um, whatever, was also important. Enabling those teachers to get access to what is good practice and having somebody out, out of the classroom who can hunt up resources, hunt up ideas, and then work with the teachers in the classroom in terms of implementing what those um, practices are, um, supporting them, giving them feedback, um, was critical. Modelling good lessons, and the Aboriginal people were um, an invaluable resource. And then the last one is the envisaged mathematical norm. So these are, if you think about them, these are really big principles. And if you start to think about what they are um, and what they might mean for you as a teacher um, or a school leader. Uh, so leadership is, is critical. Um, you have to develop a, po a positive mathematics culture. Um, so many of the schools we go to, they'll say um, words like, I'm strong. The, the, I mean, you might have heard of the strong and deadly uh, institute from, um, it was a QUT, it's now at the University of Canberra under Chris Sara. Um, making the kids feel proud about being Aboriginal um, or making the kids feel proud that they're from St Albans or wherever you're, I think St Albans is a low SES area? Yeah, okay. Um, or from Corio, from Whittington, I'm, I was originally from Geelong so I know that area a little bit better. Um, but having, having those that, 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 that strong culture about being proud of who you are rather than being ashamed of who you are. Because if you're ashamed, you're not going to learn. And the, the other one was developing a whole school approach. Now the whole school approach was very, was very um, critical because it meant that when teachers went into the, um, the staff meetings, they had a common thing that they could talk about. So there was often in these schools a lesson, a lesson structure now you might think this is a little strange, but in many of the schools they had a two hour literacy block, no surprise there, we all know literacy is very important. But then they had, believe it or not, a two hour numeracy block every day. And then the last hour of the school day was for everything else because they, they knew that literacy and numeracy were critical for these kids. How would you run a two hour numeracy block? You have it structured in sort of little sessions. So there's a, a fast-paced revision. Um, then there was um, quick number facts, something about learning, always something about priming. Because if you think about the communities, there's not a lot of the priming that we get in, in a city where, you, where you we're immersed in numbers. The houses don't have numbers. Most of the kids don't know what their birthday is, so they were born either on the 1st of January or the 1st of July. Um, so all those things that we take for granted um, just aren't in those, in those communities. So they have to have prompts to remind them all the time about what is volume, what is a fraction, what is this, and they prime them. Um, so that having that consistency right across the school meant that as the kids progressed through the school, they knew what to expect in a maths lesson. This is how maths works at our school. So they weren't behaviour problems when the kids were thinking, well, what's going on here? So that whole school approach, I think, is critical. Okay, so let's go through the mathematical norms. How are we going for time? I sort of didn't think that. Okay, we've got 12 minutes left. So when we talk about, so what I want to do is each of those mathematical norms, I want to take you through what we saw in terms of the classroom practices. So the norms are kind of the principles, and what I want to do is now take you through some of the examples of what they did in terms of what do we mean when we're talking about having high levels of mathematics? 
So having high expectations of all the students in your class in the classes was critical. Um, and it was the stuff about these kids are in year ten. This is what they should be learning, rather than oh these kids can't do. Um, long multiplication. These kids can't do. So if this is what they're supposed to know in year 10, let's start with that and then backward map. If they can't do this, let's see what they can do and just work out and then their goal was to get them to where they should be. And that was working in many of the schools we went to. Um, again, starting at age level learning <coughs> rather than this is what they can't do. Um, so moving totally away from the deficit thinking, there was a lot of strong scaffolding. Working out, if this is where I want the kids to get to, how am I going to do that? Remembering that many of the kids don't come to school every day. And one of the things I learned very early on um, in the project was sometimes one student might come in one day a fortnight. But the teachers would say, while I've got the kids at school today, I have to make the most of his or her learning because I may not see them for another two weeks. I've been in other schools where they've said, well, he doesn't come very often, I'll just give him some colouring in because he can't do anything. Um, but it was that attitude of saying, well, I've got to make the most of while this... They've, they've decided they're going to come to school today, so let's hit them hard, not too hard, um, but let's hit them hard in terms of what, what we might be able to do and maximise what they can learn while they're here. Identifying, there's a lot of data in these schools about what the kids can do and there's lots of online programs that the teachers use. Not expensive programs, um, but cheap ones that you can get off the internet. They identified where they were and they did the mapping. And more often than not, they actually showed, they had data walls where you could see where all the kids were. They often had a, a little photo of the child so the kid could see where they were. But they weren't as, as in saying, well, you're only working at grade three level. Or you're, this is, they would actually have the mathematical concepts that the kid could show that they were doing. So it wasn't saying you're below level or whatever. This is what you can do and this is where we're going to go next. Um, which was very, a very productive way to go. Um, and they had age level pedagogy because often you might have a child in year 10 who might be working at a grade 3 level, teaching them the same way we would teach in early childhood when you're an adolescent is inappropriate. So the kids would disengage. No surprise there. So having age appropriate pedagogy was really important. So that's how they were achieving high levels of mathematics. Um, embedding the mathematics was really critical. So there were two ways of embedding it. One was often what we would think of is in the context of the learners. So what would, the, what would they be doing in that community? One way of teaching proportion was fishing, fish, fish size and hook size, because they all like fishing. So when you're teaching proportion, why not use it in a context of fishing, those sorts of things. There was a lot of revision um, because there's, there's, um, one of my teachers said to me, it's like Groundhog Day here. You teach them this today, they come back tomorrow and they don't remember a thing. Now, he had very deficit thinking, um, but what we need to do is rather than say they, can't, they, don't, they don't remember, let's just say, well, for me, it's a little... And I keep coming back, back to the French example. I didn't practice my French, so I forgot it. Does that mean that I'm a bad learner? No, it just meant that I didn't get enough time to practice it. It's the same in mathematics. When they go to the shop, they don't say, well, I've got $5, I can buy this. They'll go in, they'll take the items that they want, they'll give the money over, um, and if they haven't got enough money, they just have to put things back until they can pay for it. So the, the, the number role of the um, interaction isn't there. It's like, I've got $5 and I'll work out. And if I, I've got some change, I'll just go and buy some more things until I run out of money. So things are done differently. So if we're going to teach number facts, or if we're going to teach um, automaticity in number, we need to be doing it regularly so that they can practice it. Um, so revision was really important. The fast facts was also important. Rather than say they can't do it, let's work out ways that they can do it. And there are lots of ways they did those things. So they might have had a PowerPoint slide on and you just work through and it was always self-competition, self not how did I go with the rest of the class today, I got 20 right. That's better than what I did yesterday when I got 19 or 15 or whatever. So it was always about me as the child rather than where they were with the rest of the class. Um, they'd often have a little clock, um, a digital clock on, on the whiteboard, um, the electronic whiteboard, um, and that would run down and they'd see how many they can get done. Those sorts of things. So uh, having that speed was also important. Priming for learning, as I said before, was also really important. So 
in that um, revision, if, if my main lesson was going to be on um, volume, um, in the revision, one of the activities we would, they would do was going to be on volume. So the kids were primed about volume. They didn't have to start the lesson thinking, well, we're doing volume today. What was volume? That's that thing I turn up on the, oh, no, the remote. Um, that thing that I push the button on to make the TV louder. That's the wrong volume. So just priming them so that when you wanted to teach what you wanted to teach, the kids were already ready for it. You didn't have to um, spend a lot of that next part of the lesson on reteaching something. So the revision was embedded in there. A lot of use of um, digital tools. A lot of the Indigenous kids love digital media. Um, so there was a lot of that. The lesson planning and structure, I've sort of talked a little bit about that, having those very distinct parts of a lesson. Um, embedding the mathematics in the culture and the community was really important. So I'm just working with a school up in North Queensland. Um, and again, positional language is very, um, I don't want to say weak, um, it's something the kids don't talk about. So what we've done, um, we've just created a whole lot of big books and we've got the kids standing on top of the um, clay gym, under, <coughs> underneath, next to, beside. But it's all about the kids, so they're all out in the um, playground and it's all that relational, positional language with the kids. So the kids are just enthralled by seeing photos of themselves and they know the words and we've highlighted the words. And one of the schools I worked at, um, they actually had it in English, standard Australian English like we would do in mathematics and then they put the Aboriginal person translated into the home language so they could see it in both languages. Um, and sometimes they had the words um, in the home language and sometimes they had to use the English word. Um, but they, the kids actually worked through that. So having those things that engage the kids at a level that, oh, not at a level, but in a context that they like, they enjoy, actually made the, the learning more uh, relevant and meaningful. Um, make it, and the others are, are, are obvious, making it meaningful and purposeful so that they knew why they were doing things. So a lot of the schools, um, have, because there's no shopping community or the shop is a community store, they would set up their own little shops. They might have a banking system, so when you did things, you got actually money put into a little bank account. And then at the end of each term or the end of each week, you could shop in the school shop and depending on how much money you had, you could buy something or you could save it and buy something better next week. Um, some of the schools would actually give them real money and once a term they'd take them into Port Hedland or a big major area, they'd go into Coles and they could spend that money. Inevitably, those kids would spend money on their family, not so much on themselves. So having those contexts make it... <coughs> purposeful, well, then they understand what the sense of money is. Because if they're going to the community store, as I said, and they've got five dollars and they do that other bargain, they don't get um, financial <laughs> literacy. So that was really important. So that embedding was important. I've talked a fair bit about the role of language. Having that um, in the early years, so some of the schools we went to, the first three years they do a bilingual program and then by grade four they move into only English. Um, others haven't got that support to do it in their home language or a bilingual program and so they just launch straight into it. But having those Aboriginal people in the classroom really helps um, the teachers in terms of translating between the two languages. Creating resources was really important um, and again if you look through the case studies there's a lot of work, a lot of case studies on different things teachers have used. So that a lot of them have made big books, a lot of them have translated um, nursery rhymes into something around the context about um, you know the five five pies in the in the Bayaloo store um, and like instead of mother duck because they don't see ducks um, so they've done those sorts of things posters prompt sheets lots of prompt sheets with words around what those words mean creating word word, word walls so that the kids can actually see the words themselves know what they are. Um, Create, and I'll just go through those, but creating where the kids create their own dictionary, validating the home language. What we did find was that when you do a lot of these resources, it's not enough just to have a word wall or a prop sheet or definitions sitting on the wall. You actually have to teach the kids to go to that resource. So the teachers would actually model. So if I get stuck and I don't know what tessellate means, what do I do? And in, inevitably, sometimes there's a culture of dependence um, because Aboriginal kids want to please the teachers. So, miss, 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 um, or sir, sir, sir. Um, what does that word mean? So, the teachers would model, if you get stuck, 
have a look over here and see what this is. So if I don't know a word, if you're doing shape, for example, have a look at our word wall and see what see what it can be. So it's actually the teaching and modelling to the students. If you get stuck, go to the word wall and have a look and see if you can work it out yourself. And when you can't work it out, let's ask one of your friends or let's ask somebody else. Don't always ask it. So it was teaching them a lot of about independence as well. So teach, you're teaching them to use the resource rather than have a nice pretty room with all resources everywhere that the kids never use. <coughs> um, we also saw a lot of code switching. So what would happen is the kids might speak Creole, they might speak English. So the teachers, rather than say, well, in school, the kids might say, they'll, they'll often say things quite crudely, oh, like, rather than I need to go to the toilet, they might say, I need to, I want to go to the, and they'd use another word. Um, and the teacher would say, that's Creole. In classroom, we speak English. So you know those wristbands you have for sporting events, the little rubber bands? So they'd have one in English and one in, for one for Creole. And rather than the teacher always saying, now we're going to do this, now we're going to do this, they just point. And it took a lot of time out of the lesson so the kids would know, oh, I've said that in Creole, but the teacher wants me to say it in English. So I better say it in English. So please, Miss, may I go to the toilet? That's okay, and off you go. Or this is how we say it in English, or this is how we say it in Creole, and that was okay. So it, it actually enabled the kids to code switch really well. Um, so I think that's it. So transparency I've talked a little bit about. Um, making sure the kids really know what they're doing. Um, so it's getting out to that secret, secret knowledge. So having the learning intent shared, stated and shared. So the kids actually know what's going on. Also about behaviour, what things we will expect. Now, of course, there's the behaviour, but there's also in maths classrooms, um, in, say, things like group work or if we're doing investigations, what behaviour do we expect? What do we ex expect from those children? Um, and making that very clear to them. Learning ladders were um, displayed, so as I said before, kids could actually see where they were going, uh, where they had to go and where they were on that continuum being explicit about what the lesson was actually going to look like at the start of the lesson. So it's not just about the lesson outcomes, but the lesson itself, and having consistency. And that's one of the things that was really important in so many of the schools, was the schools kept saying, we've got to be consistent, because once we change, the kids don't know what the rules of the new game are. And that happened when I left my school. Um, one of the staff said to me, oh my God, we're going to get a new principal again. We're going to get a whole lot of new stuff coming in. We just want the same thing to happen. And a lot of the schools are very change weary because a new person comes in, this person didn't do a good job, I'm going to fix it up, so I'm going to do change, regardless of what was actually working. Um, we did a big study in the Northern Territory and of something like the 40 schools we worked with, only two schools didn't change when a new principal came in. So that's a lot of change. Okay, I'm going to have to go quickly. Um, mathematics lessons um, have to engage at the student's level of understanding. So a lot of assessment for learning, um, the use of data walls, scaffolding, I've gone through a fair bit of that. Having a strong mathematical knowledge from the teacher was also important because teachers need to see the network of mathematics so that they could move forward. Differentiation without shaming. So that's not ability grouping. So what we often would see was children would work on a sheet and it might be their magic, they'll have um, number facts around a number, um, you know, what's doubling, count them, either side counting, backwards counting, forwards. So they had the same sorts of tasks, but every student might have had a different number. I might have been working in the number range from one to 10. Somebody else might have been working with hundreds, somebody else might have been working with fractions or decimals. But all of those kids, for all intents and purposes, when they looked around, everybody was doing the same thing. So there was no shame about having different tasks. So they could all engage. Targeted learning, and I've talked a little bit about grouping as well. So I think that's there that the mathematical norms that I think are really important in terms of the enacted math mathematical norms. And hopefully you've got something out of that about what you might be able to do in your class. If you want to go and have a look at the project website, please do. All of the case studies are there with a lot more detail on them. Um, and it's all freely available. So, any questions? Oh, do you want me to go back? Yeah? The easiest way, that, that website. Thank you. That website address is hard to get to, so just go to the University of Canberra, use the search tool, type in remote numeracy and you'll get there. 
Um, just before we go, because we've actually, the session actually finishes at quarter past ten, um, so that's actually all included in. So we've actually got a bit of time just to ask if anyone's got one or two questions that they might like to ask. And um, <laughs> Robin, if you're incredibly inspiring yet again, um, you know, lecture, is there anyone who has any questions? And if you do, if you could just say your name, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying not to talk right down into you because there could be problems with that. But anyway, um, if you could, <laughs> yes, if you could uh, say your name, your school, and then your um, question, please. Yep. Hi, I'm Richard from the Arthur College. Um, my, my question is, what happens to this, the mass learning is then staying in a community where there is no numeracy in mathematics and they, they don't maybe set their sights and have opportunities to go elsewhere to further that. So we teach them a whole new language, a whole new way of thinking, and then they go and play in a group there. You yeah. know what I mean? So yes. what happens to that? I think there is the stuff with the kids still need to be empowered because what often happens as adults, and we've seen it in so many places, these guys just get ripped off like you wouldn't believe. Uh, there are some really unscrupulous operators in remote areas, whether it's in the community store or whether it's around their Centrelink payments or whether it's around buying fuel, um, not getting the right change. So they still need to be numerate. And unfortunately, too many of them aren't. Like, even adults use that change system or they've got the welfare card and I'll just spend them. They don't know how much money's in there. Um, they don't understand if they've got to make a repayment to spurs or any of those other things they don't understand. For example, we were selling cars off from our college and we wanted to sell, I can't remember the figure, but let's say it was $9,000. Some community people said, yeah, we've got that. I said, we can only take cash because, you know, you can't take a loan. And they came over, they had $900. They didn't know the difference between $9,000 and $900. So there are those things that they still need to have basic numeracy. Is that, is that what you meant, that sort of thing? Yes, I also want to I'm thinking about what can, can, do they get to go for them? Do they get to have, do they start seeing the value in it for themselves and say, I actually enjoy thinking this way and I want to know a bit more. Now, opening their mind yes. to see a big picture and a different, you know, a different future. Right? There's a lot, of, a lot of the kids in the communities, when they turn, go to high school, when they're high school age, some will stay in community for all sorts of reasons. Others of them will branch out and will go to a boarding school, say down in Cairns or Toowoomba or Perth or those places. Um, and there was just a, a beautiful story a while ago of a person in Halls Creek. She was an Aboriginal kid, went through Halls Creek High School, went to university and has just come back to Halls Creek as the doctor. So there are a lot of them, and most of the communities want to be self-governing. Most of the communities want Aboriginal people to run the council, to run the store, to be the CEO of the art gallery and all the other things in community. To do that, they have to have education. Um, so there are a lot of aspirations around what they can do. Um, so yes, um, there are opportunities, but I think part of it is we've got to, as educators, we've got to find out what it is that they want to know too. Like the whole stuff about context. What is it about those contexts? that make these kids think and engage and want to learn, rather than doing some of the horrible, mindless repetition that we do do. Worksheets, worksheets, worksheets. Having said that, a lot of kids like the worksheets because they have success. Mm. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes. And could you just say your name and, and your association? Yeah. Uh, I'm Tierney and I'm from QAMT in Queensland. Okay. I was actually really interested in the idea of the schools creating the whole school maths approach and talking about the data walls and I was wondering if that was something that teachers co-created or if they you know, with their numeracy coaching with their yes. principal and so forth. Yeah. Or if they somehow ended up getting that from the Australian curriculum or something. No. Like the, the, if you go through some of the case studies, um, some schools were so focused, all the schools focused on data. Some of them collected data just for data's sake and didn't do anything with it. But most of the data walls were things that were relevant to those classrooms. So they created their own. It wasn't something they printed off from the um, national curriculum or C2C or whatever. Um, they actually made their own. And they made them that they were and they made them in a language that the kids could see. So they could see. I can add two numbers, I can add three numbers. Um, and whatever, I'm, I'm sure they were taken from the 
national curriculum because that's what you've got to do as a teacher anyway. You've got to report against that. But they wrote them in a language for the kids because it was for the kids and the parents to come in. So parents could come in and see. And some of, so some of them had, well, this is where they were at the start of the, a, a period and this is where they are now. So parents, they might not have understood what all the words were, but they could see there's been this growth. Um, one school um, we worked in, they actually had a data wall that was in the um, main corridor. And so anyone who could come into the school. So you've got to make, they made sure it wasn't a shame job, like you're right back here. And what they were really mapping on was say, here's where you were, here's where you are now. Um, it was more about the growth part of it. So that's what they really focused on. So you could see the growth rather than saying, well, Johnny's in grade seven, but he's way back here. That's not very good. They really made sure that that wasn't going to be the message that they got. Um, and it was much more about the growth. Yeah. Uh, if there's any further questions, maybe if you'd like to ask Robin afterwards um, and she could spend some time and um, just a few minutes afterwards. Sure. If you're, yeah. Okay. So um, we'd like to now <laughs> close this keynote. Uh, <laughs> oh, we've just got the one mic, so maybe I'll take Okay. Um, so we'd like to now close the keynote on behalf of the MAV. We'd like to thank Robin for, yeah, really, yeah. Uh, utterly inspiring um, work that you've been doing and sharing that with us and just your, you know, the depth of knowledge that I, I think you, we've all got something that we can take away from that um, and act in our own um, learning environments now. So thank you for that. And here's a little gift. Ooh, thank you very thank much. Thank you. And uh, if we could all thank Robin for... <laughs>